Here is part three, where we're going to concentrate on what makes the software tick and the value of this wonderful IDE. So this is the way things were pre-Arduino period, everybody just trying to hack their way through life. So what we're going to look at here is extending Arduino's reach, dig into the software and uh, the use of libraries, how C++ classes work, and get into the software statements. So here's a good reference of where to go to find out more about the Arduino um, software base. And um, you should look into these. So here's where we get started. So let's review our, uh, our main player here. Our Arduino um, processor will be, uh, it's good, what I'm going to talk about is good for all the Arduino family, but um, all of my demos will be uh, using the Uno. So here's our basic arrangement. Uh, our IDE uh, resides on our um, laptop computer or desktop computer. You know, we, uh, we create a sketch and we have access to the serial monitor. And we have a, the ability to load programs into the Arduino uh, and get uh, data back from it. So let's talk about the Arduino IDE. This is its uh, basic um, mug shot. But there's, a, um, you know, we, we now know that it's based on C++. Uh, and it's actually uh, what's going on inside the IDE is it's running the Arduino.h class. So the class structure is important for us to understand because it's, it's really what holds up this whole IDE. So what we've got here, uh, real uh, C++ has a lot more um, bureaucratic uh, uh, load than what we see using the Arduino IDE. Uh, for instance, um, with uh, C++, you have to declare everything that uh, is going to happen in the program to the compiler. And that always is comes in the form of an advancement up in front and up on top of all your your software. Well, that step is hidden uh, for you by the IDE in our case. Um, so you notice we've been given these two, uh, we call them functions, uh, the uh, setup function and the loop function. But these are actually methods of the Arduino class. So... Uh, the, the IDE has gone a long ways to make everything simple for us. Um, for instance, uh, you can put uh, function calls at the bottom of uh, your sketches. Uh, you don't have to do the declarations. Um, things can be defined after they're used. Um, that's all being taken care of for you in the, in the background. So here's our basic um, steps, the, the while step, I mean the while statement, um, just uh, we'll go over in detail, but these are the, the building blocks for almost all of our programs. So here's the while statement. Um, you notice I'm, um, I'm defining a, a, a sensor input uh, going into A0. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just describe these things in a little more detail than what I've done in the past. The fact that this is going to be measuring an integer, uh, and this is the type of data you're telling the compiler this is, the reason this is important is it defines a memory space allocation. And the equal sign here is not like we think in traditional mathematics. This is an assignment symbol. So we're going to assign this pin uh, to be used uh, when we talk about this particular variable. So here's another variable that's a string type um, designated by this char uh, type. And it's given the name uh, sky. And what's really going on here is by assigning uh, a variable 
it creates a place in memory that's pointed to. Uh, and that block of memory is uh, got this uh, uh, this string in it. But it also has a, uh, a null character or return character uh, added onto it that you don't see. But we'll have to deal with it later on. Okay, here's another uh, variable that's just an integer. And so here it demonstrates the while. So while the sky is blue, and when we use the double equal sign, we're really talking about equality here. So while the, the variable sky has uh, this string in it, then uh, we go out and, and do a cloud watch here uh, with an analog read and put it into a, a, uh, a variable that's now in scope inside the, uh, the while uh, loop. Um, this particular variable, uh, this idea of scope, means that this uh, variable can't be seen outside of these uh, bracketed statements. So this is an internal variable. So it's saying if it's uh, larger than the threshold, this is a global variable, so it can be seen inside this, this uh, while statement. Um, then uh, we're going to change the value of sky to be gray. And this is the condition that will exit the while statement. Because the next time it comes back around, this equality won't exist. And the while statement will drop down in the program past the while statement and do this statement. So the while uh, statement is very, very useful and used in many situations. So here's the if statement. The if statement is our brancher. This is how we go from one place in our program to another. In this case, if target equals hostile, then you go fire a cannon. If it's not, don't you? Uh, you can see the choices that we're going to be made here. So once again, the double equal is means precisely equal, and the single equal sign means an assignment of value. Okay, the for statement is a looping but a limited loop that's under your control. So the x here is, is uh, declared in scope for this for statement um, to just to be used inside the for statement. So that's a local scope. Uh, but we have to declare what kind of a thing it is so that the proper memory will be allocated. So we start at zero. We have a, a condition we're looking for here. When, as long as x is less than or equal to 255, then this will continue to loop. Uh, now, there's a lot involved with this um, increment um, um, statement here where we're increasing x by 1. This plus plus is actually the idea behind um, uh, C++. Plus plus. It, it was a, a bump up from C. But uh, when you put the two uh, plus signs after the variable, it means do the operation and then um, increment the x. If you, you can put the, the two pluses on the front side, and that would increment the x before the process is done. Uh, so that is a possibility. Uh, but that's why this, this doesn't get out of sync or messed up, is, is you do this loop, then you increment x to do the next loop. So we're going to analog write to an LED this, this amount. Um, if we get halfway um, through, then um, we print that out. Notice here in this if statement, since there's only one statement involved in the, the if block, we don't need the curly braces. Um, now here, we have uh, more than one statement, so we, we need the um, curly braces. So um, we've reached the set point, and now we're going to go the other direction and decrement, and the brightness gets less and less and less, da 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 da. So I think you can see how the for statement works now. Now the switch statement is, is very useful to reduce a massive amount of use, overusing the if statement, is really what it's for. So we take a, a variable that we're going to trigger off of, um, in this case called target, 
And then we, uh, whatever value that is, uh, it, it's apparently a um, char type variable. Uh, we're going to compare it to these cases. Uh, and if it, if uh, what's in this value here is far, then we go to this function. Yeah, but and if uh, if it's near, we go to this one. If it's close, we go to this one. And if none of these match, then we default out to this one. So this is the structure of the switch statement. Now notice a very important thing here. We have a break statement, which means that let's say it it evaluates to near. So we go off and do this um, function, then we come back and then we break out of uh, this instance of using the switch and go back to the program. If we didn't have this, then what would happen? Let's say we come in here with far. It would do this, then it would drop down here and do this, then it would drop down here and do this. Uh, that would uh, completely mess up the purpose of keeping these separate. So um, that's why the break statement has to be there. And we definitely need a default in case none of these... Um, prove out to be true. So a do while statement is kind of an oddball, but it does have a particular purpose and hopefully this demonstrates that. So here's our variables and the do part here means it's going to go through this one time regardless. And, um, and if the conditions here are already met, that doesn't matter. It will still do this once and then it'll proceed into uh, the condition statement for the while. So in this case, we're going to go out and read a bunch of sensors, and um, and then we're going to check the timing. And it started out at zero. So in this first uh, increment, we we read the sensors once, and then we go um, our time goes up to five, and then we check out to see if it reached the threshold. And if it didn't, we power off the sensors. Uh, I mean, once we get to uh, 100, then we power off the sensor. So this has a purpose that you can see here and, um, and can be very useful. So functions, uh, we need to know about the set. We already know about the setup and the loop. Uh, and in most literature or people making YouTube videos, they will call them functions. But now you know they're actually methods of the Arduino class. So functions are used to perform a set of statements that will be used over and over again, and um, they're user-defined. So, so the functions can be used for uh, specific processes that simplify the program by calling the function. So in other words, we can list these functions, let's say at the bottom of our program, and then in the program, we just need to reference the name, and it makes reading your program much easier. Um, the function uh, mechanics here. Uh, if we uh, call out a function, um, we can also have it return a value, but uh, that value has to be typed so, uh, uh, so we know how much memory space uh, is going to be needed for it. We can also pass in arguments to a function that are going to be utilized inside the function. And we, once again, we block it with curly braces and it ends with a semicolon. The functions has to have a name. So here's an example. We have a function called calculate taxes. We pass in a, um, a, a parameter here that this its name gonna, is going to be used inside the function of tax rate and income, and it's a type float. So once the taxes are calculated, they return. There will be a return statement that will bring it back to where it was called as a float type number or a number that that contains a decimal point. So here's an example. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of uh, variables, the C and the F. Uh, in our setup, we just start the, um, the serial monitor. And in the loop, we go out and read a sensor, a temperature sensor, sensor and we convert this integer we up here to a uh, float 
and uh, uh, and put it in the in the memory space for the the uh, C variable. Now the reason we did this is um, the analog read is going to be an integer, but we're going to use this in a calculation where it needs to be a float. So we make the conversion here. So now here's our function. So we drop down here and we bring in uh, that temp and uh, in using this variable. So this variable doesn't have to match um, this one up here. Uh, it can be anything because this one's just going to be used in the internal scope of the function. But it will return a float. So we bring that in and in this case it'll be um, um, the C, uh, this value up here. So uh, we take that and that will go in this location, we'll multiply it by 1.8 and we add 32 and we uh, that becomes F and then we return F. F now is right here. So we can print the centigrade one from up here and then we can print the Fahrenheit one from here and so on and wait five seconds and do it again. So that uh, shows you that the use of functions to be uh, called just by a simple instance of it up here. So classes in C++. Um, some of the things, that you, you don't have to have a thorough education in C++ to use the Arduino, but the more you know about it, the more it makes sense on what it's doing. And uh, one of the things that you will pick up in if you study C++ is a class is really a data structure. It's an object that contains uh, properties and methods. And in that world, a property is just a variable that you're going to store an input in. And the methods are the functions that are uh, that are worked that work inside the class. So object-oriented program, uh, a class ends up uh, as utilitarian usage is a template. So we can make uh, several copies of, of a, a class that's just been described once. So it's a very effective way to uh, build complex programs. And we do that just by uh, uh, having an instance of the class. And it, it's known as an object, which is basically a clone based on the description of how the class works. And you, these can be chained together. There can be a hierarchy of classes that uh, are all uh, dependent on each other. Um, so it becomes its own data type. So when you create a class, it occupies a memory space that contains all these properties and methods. So it, um, it becomes its own uh, type data structure. So clarifies and simplifies program and exemplifies reuse of code because you can take a, a very useful class and put it in other programs and it'll work the same way. Okay, so general description. Um, the H file is a declaration of what makes up the class for the compiler. So now you're getting the idea that that when you write a program in C, it's actually a collection of files, not just one. And the compiler combines all these in the proper way to uh, make everything work. Now the .cpp uh, file holds the structure of the class and fleshes out the design. It's, it's the details that are described in the .h file. Now the other thing that the .h file does for us is it identifies the name of the class. Um, so uh, we put that in the include statement. And, and <clears throat> so the way the Arduino uh, finds these classes is it places them in libraries. So if the library, if, if some library you're gonna use like, a, like the servo library, uh, it's in a, a, a folder, a directory called library, so it's not with your program. So that's why they use the angle brackets. Now, you can have a .h file uh, inside your program folder, 
uh, to be a reference for a whole bunch of variables or like when you do the, use the tone method and you're going to make music, um, uh, that could be all the notes uh, of the piano, or f for instance, just listed there, defined. And in that case, if the .h file is part of your program, then you put it in quotes and not angle brackets. So you'll see that if, um, sometime during your Arduino programming experience. Um, use of the class name to create a local object. Okay, this is how you do it. Here's our class. We um, making a, an object now, and, and which is a clone, and use the servo class as a blueprint. And uh, when uh, the class needs to know which pin we're going to use, that the servo is connected to it, and this is how we pass it into the class. That gives you an example. Uh, so the, these two files um, in in the sketch directory or library folder is at the root level of our program. So what do we got here? This is an example of a .h file library and um, is given by this name. So this tells a compiler to expect a class with three functions known as, as methods, as I noted down here, and one variable known as a property. Uh, so here's our class Morse. It's got a public um, 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 method here. It's got a, uh, another method. So we have three methods here and a, and a, a variable that's uh, brought in uh, to the class from the outside. Um, so what's going on here is uh, some housekeeping that C++ does to make sure that this uh, particular .h file is only, uh, only uh, called once. So your program and the compiler work together, but what compilers do, do is a behind the scenes and is another whole uh, learning experience. So Here's the, uh, the, the .cpp file for that, that goes with that morris.h file. You notice that when you uh, build one of these, this, is, this sort of thing will be found in an Arduino library. Um, they call out the arduino.h because, after all, that is a class. And that gives us access to these uh, particular, uh, peculiar uh, methods to that uh, Arduino class. So this is the structure to define the, uh, a, a constructor of the Morris class and shows where the pin comes in. So this is the fleshing out of what was described in the dot H. So um, this tells uh, it's, the pin is going to be an output and we're going to take whatever pin the user gives us and put it in this variable, which is that uh, property of the class. So the dot method, uh, well, basically what it's going to do is put a high out on that pin for a quarter of a second and then turn it off. So the difference between that, a, a dot and a dash, is just a longer time that it's turned on. So um, we have, I mentioned this before, we have to include the, the uh, Arduino.h and this makes up what the compiler uh, needs to know to be able to um, operate. Then we put it in a library, it, now we have access to it through that .h. So here's our little program. So all we have to do is include Morris.h and the, the, whatever's going on in that class comes with this declaration here. So we're you know, an instance of Morris. So I just give it any name when I call it Morris. We're going to use pin 13. So that means we're going to use the little LED built onto the uh, Arduino. We don't even need to in initialize anything. So we just leave a setup blank. So in the loop, we're going to call Morris. Uh, the dot method three times, then the dash three times, and then the dot three times, 
and then we're going to wait three seconds. So this will this will um, uh, do Morse code of SOS. So this would be dot 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 dash 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 dot dot dot. So that gives you a kind of an overview about uh, how all of this comes to uh, pass in our programs. Um, and it makes everything so much simpler because all we have to do is write this program and the power that's being brought in by the class is in the background. Hopefully this uh, makes uh, this a little easier to uh, see. So uh, what I'm going to do here is actually do this Morse code type of operation but uh, we're going to use um, um, another program that I'm going to detail out here. So uh, this is a, I have a, a, a library called Telegraph that will break apart and see what its guts are. But it's a little more complicated. So uh, after we go through this, you'll be able to appreciate um, just how um, uh, feature packed these classes are from from libraries that you get and you really wouldn't want to write all that code out for each time you wanted to send some Morse code in this case so we got to have to we have to define our speaker pin we have to define how long in milliseconds a dit is how long is the message we're going to allow to be read in from a serial interface our baud rate we need to establish that and uh, we're going to use a line feed to tell our program when the end of the message is and to go ahead and start beeping out the Morse code. And we're going to have, uh, have an LED that's going to be um, flashing with our Morse code. And we have a message. So this is an array of characters uh, up to 128 that we'll uh, want to fill, put our message in and then an index used for the message. We also have a flag here that's a Boolean type, either true or false, to tell us whether to print out uh, what the message says in ASCII letters plus the code or just the code. So in this case, it's true. It'll print both of them out. Um, so here is the instance of the class Telegraph. I just call it Telegraph. And we supply it the output pin, the dit length, and the flag. And we'll see how this is utilized in the .cpp file of the Telegraph class. Okay, so we're going to set up the baud rate. We're going to um, define the LEDs and output and our output pin to the speaker. And um, the uh, we're also going to note the, the uh, pin 13 and make sure it gets turned off because we don't want the LED that's built into the Arduino to uh, flashes in the face here. So in the loop, what the serial available method is, or the available method of the serial class, uh, which is a built-in, uh, give it to you free type class that's that's uh, part of Arduino.h. If that guy is uh, got something in the buffer, by the way, the serial buffer is 64 characters. Um, so we actually call that something larger than would be in a buffer uh, normally. Anyway, uh, we're going to read in, uh, using the read method, a character. And it gets uh, put into this local variable in scope of this if statement. Alrighty, and then um, if uh, the, uh, this character we read, if it happens to be a line feed, or we hit the end of our message. And the reason this minus one is here is because at the end of all strings, there's a return character that we um, don't want to count is in the length of our message. Then we're going to use that index. Uh, well, what's going to happen here is our index is going to be zeroed out and uh, uh, the message that we received um, will be um, um, this method will get the message and we'll see what this does a little bit later on. Else, this means the character is something we need to read into our message matrix and we read it into the current index and then um, 
increment the index for the next character. So that's what's going on there. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, when we're done. If we put this message in and hit the send button, um, then what we're going to get is each letter as it gets beeped out as a, um, and it shows you the Morse code here along with it. So that's what this program does. Um, and if we change that flag to false, then we get the, the message in Morse code only. So that's what it does. Now, um, before we get to the demo here, this is the, the structure of the telegraph class, kind of like we described the simpler version, but this gets a little bit hairier here. So we're going to have our pin come in, our dit length, and our flag. Okay, we know that. So in our, uh, we're going to define this uh, output pin that came in here and put it inside uh, an internal uh, private um, variable of the same name. Notice that the, that the, the uh, doc is defined as being three times as long as is the dit. Uh, and then we want to use the output pin. We want to define it using the Arduino uh, class here. And then we put flag into the flag variable. So that's all stored away now in this class in this uh, using a constructor. So the, the uh, CPP part of the telegraph class, we have to include um, some um, a library that's part of the C library to get this to work. So we tell a compiler to do that. And we tell it to uh, grab the Arduino uh, class and the telegraph uh, uh, class out of the library. Now, this is all called linking. So the compiler links all of these into or with our program. Um, this spell a variable is a, is a static variable that's just held once inside this class. And you'll see later that that happens to be the one that tells you whether to print out the words or the letters or not the letters. And this is how we... Um, combine these uh, letters and it'll also do numbers in a very clev clever scheme here. This um, uh, type is called a pointer. It's pointing to an array in memory that has all these symbols in it. And these are all of our Morse code done in periods and in, in hyphens. But it also has another really sneaky um, uh, hidden amount of information by the index. So this H, for instance, is at um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's at this, the, well, it starts at 0. So this is the index 7. So we can use this index number to find out what the ASCII uh, letter is and associate it with these four dots. So there's this these are kind of these hidden tricks that we were talking about. So what is ASCII? Uh, it stands for American Standard Code of Information Interchange. is one of the first things that was defined uh, when computers starting to be used. So we could get to letters and punctuations. Now you notice all this buzz up here. Uh, this had to do with teletypes because this was used originally. Uh, for sending teletype. You notice it's got a, even got a bell in it here. But for instance, if we want to locate the letter A, uh, this is hexadecimal, by the way, and so is this. So it, um, an ASCII uh, 41, uh, which is, uh, this would be uh, 0100, and this would be 0001. Uh, if you put those together, it ends up being a decimal 65, and the uh, the computer realizes that's an A. Now, the uh, the H in the list here is uh, a decimal 72. So here's our little trick. We're going to use our index here. By subtracting the decimal value for an A from the decimal out value that we want to go to, we get the index 
uh, to find the Morse code symbol. So that's why I showed you all this. And uh, in another day, we'll talk about how uh, hexadecimal code is used as a cheap and dirty way to uh, keep track of all those ones and zeros in the binary representation. Okay, so here's how it sends the message. It gets the message in, and this char uh, pointer here is to an array, is to, looks at that array. And uh, this, this guy here is actually a method. Uh, that we'll describe on the next page. And it's the one that tells whether to print out the words or not. So now we go into a for loop. That's the, this, this is the reason we needed that, cla uh, that library out of the uh, C language, because it has string length as a method built into the C li uh, language. So we're going to find out the length of this message, and then we're going to increment it through it, now you notice we're going to change all of the letters we find one at a time to upper upper uh, case. That's just to make it all uniform and not be confused whether it is or isn't. And we're going to use this from the C language is alphanumeric. Uh, if, if that's not a punctuation or a, a bell or whatever from the ASCII table, uh, then we're going to check to see if... Uh, the spell thing is true or false, and if it is, we'll go ahead and print the character out. Then we're going to check out another method that's inside this class is the letters. We're going to take that current letter, subtract the value of the letter A so we can find its index, and then uh, we're going to create a delay the uh, length of, of a DA. In other words, it's going to be, I think it was 300 milliseconds. To, uh, to go in between these letters, and they're going to uh, uh, beep out here. And, or if it's a digit, we can print that out too. Um, and so on, it gives the, uh, the length of delay in between characters. And then if it's a blank, uh, then we're going to just print a blank. So this will be the space between words, and we'll delay... Um, uh, 700 milliseconds and then we'll print spaces between letters so this massive loop here will do everything we need to do um, okay here's that output code uh, method we uh, bring in that code and we find the uh, the uh, symbol uh, if it's if it happens to be uh, we go through each one of those symbols in that uh, array, letters array. If it happens to be period, we do the dit. If it happens to be <laughs> a uh, or else, if it's got to be a, uh, a dash. And uh, so a dit will print out this. And uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, this goes on and on and on. So we have to do this method to get the sound to work. So we analog write uh, to the uh, pin 10 this value here. Uh, and the speaker puts out 490 hertz. So it'll just go beep. And for the length of whether it was a dot or dash. And this is where we use that flag to tell uh, set the spell variable, internal variable here to whether it's true or false. So oh, you can see that there's a lot going on in any kind of a uh, class that does much because it's so detailed. So let's take a look at our little circuit here. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at our Arduino here. Uh, what I got here is this big blue LED that'll do the Morse code. It's got a 220 ohm resistor, got a speaker back here with a 100 ohm uh, to a current limit that. So let's type in on our serial interface H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D. Now you notice I put it in little letters and we'll see uh, how it will get that. OK, 
Okay, you notice that the uh, letters have been um, typed out with caps, so it doesn't matter what we put in in um, it, at the top. See what it does with that apostrophe. So it just skipped the apostrophe. Okay, so that's how the um, little Morse code works, Morse code uh, uh, class in our little program. Okay, let's do one other feature. Let me go back over here to the code and turn our flag into false, F-A-L-S. Now we will load that onto the Arduino. Okay, so now I'll go back to our serial interface. Let me just clear the interface. And we'll do um, um, now is the time. Now it's not going to print out the letters. Okay, that uh, shows us if we turn that, um, what was it called, the flag to false, it drops out the letters. So that's the demo. Okay, so um, let's uh, continue our description of the Telegraph um, uh, library uh, just to show you what um, comes into the folder for this particular library or any library. There'll be example uh, programs There'll be um, our .h and our .cpp, but there's also this uh, text file called keywords. And our Arduino uh, uh, IDE gives us the ability to um, make printouts for uh, when we get into our program, it'll identify uh, the keywords. So uh, the word telegraph and send message uh, are the, these functions that show up in our program, they'll be color coded so you can you can see them. Uh, so that's part of the uh, library. So let's sum it up here. The uh, the dot h is a declaration for the compiler to set up space, and the uh, cpp for the cpp file, which defines the algorithms and variables being used in that file. This little keyword. Um, um, dot text file uh, is included in the in the folder and gives you the the keyword one gives you this orange color and comment text is in gray and um, the booleans are in blue and, and you can define these things so all three of these guys are um, uh, put in the folder and a, and a folder full of sketches that uh, that uh, uh, show you how to use the, the class, and that's standard practice for any library. So that, let's conclude this and wrap it up, and uh, go forth and compute.